Well, happy Sunday morning to everybody. I'm so thankful that you are joining us uh, for this time of worship. Um, this morning, I'm uh, going to do a message that really kind of ties into what's happening at the church, and that's that we're wrapping up Vacation Bible School 2021. Uh, 
you know, I hated missing it, but I've got to hear some stories and just so grateful that we're able to to be able to do VBS and uh, just love on children and their families. And so if you have your Bibles, uh, let's go to Hebrews chapter 6 uh, together as this morning's message is entitled, Jesus is our anchor. Let's be honest, life can be really crazy, can it? It seems like in one moment we're on top of the world, things are going well, but then uh, it just takes one thing, maybe a phone call, a text, uh, a doctor's visit, or just life in general, and something knocks us down. Because of the unpredictability of life, a lot of times we feel like we're on an emotional roller coaster, uh, you know, really high or, or really low. And, and we know it's not healthy to be on this big emotional swing, but oftentimes we struggle to figure out how can I get off of this roller coaster. Uh, this year's Vacation Bible School theme was anchored. It was about diving deeper into God's Word and allowing the Bible uh, to serve as our anchor for life. And, you know, it got me to thinking, what exactly is the purpose of an anchor? But also, how is Jesus and the Bible uh, an anchor for us? Uh, the one big thing this morning is this, that because of who he is and his faithfulness to his promises, Jesus is the only one who can anchor our life and our eternity. And so let's look at it together. Again, Hebrews chapter 6, I'm going to begin in verse 13. It says, For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise of the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope that is set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this morning and this opportunity to study your word. And God, I pray for those who are watching on this live stream right now, uh, as well as those who are a part of worship uh, there in the sanctuary. Lord, let it be about you and not about us. Strengthen us. Give us ears to hear and hearts to receive the truth of your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, because of who he is, and his faithfulness to his promises. Jesus is the only one who can anchor our soul in this life and for all of eternity. So as we begin this morning, I just kind of want us to ask a question. What is an anchor? You know, really, an anchor is about security. It's, it's a tether. It fixes a, a boat or whatever you've tied to it to a specific place. An anchor keeps something secure no matter what weather comes at it. It, you know, it can only take it so far. Once it gets to the end of that rope, that anchor is holding it secure. Truthfully, we all anchor our lives to something or someone. Now, it could be something that's good and, and strong or it could be a weak anchor. But we're all tying our lives our security, our peace, our hope, our purpose. We tie it to something or someone. Now, some of the most common anchors in the world today that people attach themselves to, you know, it's maybe a job, their title, relationships, money, education, hobbies, 
um, or, or a lot of other things. You know, the, uh, people even anchor themselves to a lot of religious things such as, well, I was baptized or I go to church, you know, uh, I give, I serve, uh, those types of things. And when, what I mean by they anchor themselves to those is that's what they use to give themselves peace and security when they think about life. You know, if somebody was to say, well, why should God allow us into to heaven? Uh, some of the false anchors that people use, again, are, well, I was baptized or I go to church. Or, you know, those things, it's what they bring out uh, to show that they are uh, a good person or that they are saved or, or whatever it happens to be. People think that as long as they have this, whatever this is, uh, then they're okay. Really, an anchor is whatever you put your hope in to give you peace and security in life. Now, maybe you're wondering, how can I know what is the anchor in my life? Well, I think, ask and answer this question. When life gets hard, when times become uncertain, when you get scared, what do you turn to for comfort and peace? Where do you run? That's your anchor. Whether it's Jesus or it's something else, when life is good or life is difficult, where do you turn first? That's your anchor. Again, we all turn to something or someone to stabilize the ship when, when life is getting rocked. The Apostle Paul brings this reality home in Ephesians 5, uh, verse 18. He says, And do not get drunk with wine, uh, for that's debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, the Apostle Paul wasn't uh, picking on some pet sin of drinking there. What he was really doing is he was saying there's one of two ways that you and I deal with life and the difficulties in life. We either deal with it the world's way by trying to cover up the pain or mask the pain. Um, you know, ways that we do that are alcohol, drugs, work. Um, throw yourselves into your kids. Uh, you know, other people. It's just a way to dull the pain or to ignore it altogether. Or we can turn to God and we can allow him to show us who he is and allow him to handle whatever's going on in our life. So this is what Paul's getting at, that we're anchoring ourselves either in the ways of the world or we're anchoring our life in Christ. Now, what I want us to see in the rest of our time together is how Jesus is the best anchor for your soul and for your life. So one of the things that we see here as we read the text is that one of the reasons Jesus is the best anchor is that he is in control. Whatever anchor you use to give you peace and security it's got to be big enough to actually give you peace and security. You know, if you didn't really care about having a million dollars in the bank account, then when you get a million dollars in your bank account, it's not going to be that big of a deal. But if you believe that, well, if I've got a million dollars in my bank account, then I am secure, then you are going to stress and strive and struggle to get that million dollars, right? It's got to be big enough to actually make a difference in your life. Uh, think about if you were the captain of a, a big cruise ship, okay? And would you want, as you're inspecting your ship and you're looking at the anchor, would you want to see just a five-pound paperweight as your anchor? Of course not. Why? Because there's no way that that five pound paperweight is gonna be able to secure that ship when the waves of a hurricane are blowing and rocking it back and forth. See, when you and I look or we trust in the things of the world, it's like using a five pound paperweight to anchor the Titanic. 
it may give you a little peace of mind to go, well, at least I've got an anchor, but that anchor is not going to hold. It's not going to be useful. My job may give me peace and security for now, but what happens if I lose my job? You know, I may have enough money to afford the things in life right now, but things kind of get, you know, more expensive. So if I'm looking to my job to give me peace or money, I may have it for a little bit, but I'm not going to have it long because they're temporary. They're here today. They're gone tomorrow. You know, people trust in their college degree, but what if you, you go and you get that degree and there's no jobs in your field. What good is that degree? It's none. You know, maybe I feel loved because of the relationship I'm in right now. But what happens if that relationship ends all of a sudden? What, what if they no longer love me? Or I no longer get those feelings I used to? See, the, these are the things that so often people around us, and probably even us at times, put our hope and our trust in. We may think that jobs and money and relationships are are good anchors, but the reality is they're not because they're here today and they're gone today. They're just temporary things that give us a false sense of security. As the psalmist says in Psalm 20, verse 7, some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we trust in the name of the Lord, our God. Again, it's setting up this this dichotomy that we're either trusting in the things that we see and we can control, or we're trusting in God himself. And truthfully, we're all prone to trust in the wrong things. As John Calvin said, the heart is a perpetual idol factory. The question I want to ask you this morning is this, is what you are trusting in, is it actually strong enough to give you security in the biggest storms of life? The truth is nothing in this world is that strong. Only God is. And God is strong enough because he is the one who's truly in control. In Hebrews 6, we see that God makes a promise to Abraham about giving him an heir and blessing the world through that heir. And notice who God swears by in making that promise. By himself. Why? Because there's nobody greater. Okay, Literally, God is going, I am going to promise you based on who I am because there's no one bigger, there's no one greater, and there's really no one else who is in control. And so I'm giving you my word, Abraham. If you want to know how something works, who's the best person to to go talk to? The person who assembled it or the person who created it? Of course, the person who created it. Why? Because it's theirs. They were the one that took that time and energy and they created each part to fit just right and for it to function the way they designed it to do. Well, the scripture says that all things were created by God and for God. And so if we want to know how things work, if we want to be able to understand what's going on in the world, then we need to go to the person who not only created the world, but is also in control of the world. Because there in Colossians 1, Paul says that not only is it created by him and for him, but that he sustains all things as well. You know, we often look for security and peace and and a sense of control in life only to realize that control is just an illusion for you and I, isn't it? I mean, if you really want to think you're in control, then go ahead and make plans and see how often those plans get changed. I've I've said many times uh, there at Westlake, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. Why? Because Proverbs 16, 9 says that man makes plans, but it's the Lord who directs his steps. There's nothing that I can be 
or do that's going to give me absolute security in this world on my own. Why? Because I'm not ultimately the one in control. I'm not the one that knows the end from the beginning. I'm not the one who created it and sustains it. That is God. Not only is God in control, but he's the best anchor because he is faithful to his promises. Let me ask you, have you ever had somebody lie to you? Really hurts, doesn't it? I mean, very few things sting in life quite like having somebody that you care about lie to you. But here's the joy. We never have to worry about God lying to us because it's impossible for him to lie. Our text says it as well as Titus 1-2. God is always going to be truthful with us, even when it's painful towards us. In the text there in uh, Hebrews 6, it uses two words, immutability or, or and immutable. Both words mean never changing. You see, because God doesn't change, his promises, his power, and his person remain the same today, yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13 tells us. So this is what it means. When who God was in the beginning, all the way back in Genesis and coming up through uh, Abraham and Israel and Jesus and the early church and even in today, who God was in the beginning is the same as he is today. The promises that he made in the beginning, they are just as valid and just as important for you and I as those who are saved today. So I never have to wonder, well, did God, does God still mean that? Because he does, because he doesn't change. It's why we see throughout the Old Testament this phrase. It says, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast or his faithful love endures forever. Listen, I, I want you to understand that, yes, you and I are idolaters. We often look towards things and put our hope and trust in things other than God, yet when we confess and turn from it and when he saves us, God sets his love on us and he gives us his grace and he never takes it away. You will never be more loved and accepted by God than the moment you are when you surrender to him in faith. And so let that just give you hope and encouragement this morning. Maybe you've blown it this week, but God still loves you. He is still for you, and his grace still covers you if you have surrendered to him. Why? Because God never changes. He is faithful to keep his promises. See, if you're looking for a sure, strong anchor, can you think of anyone stronger than someone who is in control of all things at all times, who never changes and never lies? Of course not. And the only person that fits that description is Jesus Christ himself. And that's why he, is, he and he alone are sufficient to be our anchor. But then there's a third reason. It's because Jesus died in our place. Verse 19 in our text talks about entering uh, the inner place behind the curtain. It's an allusion to the Old Testament, the, the tabernacle and, and the temple. And, uh, both were really talking about the temple. It's broken into three sections. Uh, there was an outer court where anybody could go. And then you would go through a gate and you would go into this inner court. And only Jewish males could go there. And then from even the inner court, there was a third place that had a veil, a curtain over it. And this was the innermost sanctuary, the most holy place. Uh, you probably heard it referred to as the Holy of Holies. And only one person, one time a year, could go there. It was the high priest, and the only day he could go there was the Day of Atonement, the day that he made a sacrifice outside of the city and brought the blood into that most holy place and put it on that mercy seat there at the Ark of the Covenant, the, the very presence of God, okay? And the beautiful thing about that in the Old Testament the sacrifice being outside of the camp pointed us to Jesus was crucified where? Outside of Jerusalem. 
And it was his blood applied to that mercy seat, not in the earthly temple, but in the heavenly temple that allowed forgiveness of sins. And that's when that veil ripped there when Jesus died. It was symbolic that his blood had now made access to God possible, but it was only through that blood. And so what we see here, the writer of Hebrews is saying that Jesus went into that inner sanctuary on our behalf, not in the earthly temple, but in the heavenly temple where his blood was applied once for all for those who surrender to him. As the high priest, Jesus performed the sacrifice. He was the sacrifice. And that blood allows the forgiveness of sins and the salvation of our souls. But because of our sinfulness, we're unable to go into that innermost sanctuary. We're unable to go to the Holy of Holies on our own. Because if, if somebody tried to go into that Holy of Holies, other than the high priest and other than on the Day of Atonement, they would be struck dead because they were trying to come to God in some other way than what God had prescribed. Well, the only way that God has prescribed for you and I to be saved from our sins is to surrender to his grace and faith in the finished work of Jesus. So if you are trying to be right with God because you go to church or you think you're a good person or you were baptized or whatever, then you're trying to go into the Holy of Holies the wrong way on the wrong day and you're the wrong person. And the result is you will die in your sins. You'll be spiritually separated from God. It's why Romans 3.20, the apostle Paul says that by no works of the flesh or the law will anybody be justified. There's nothing you and I can do that would have God accept us. Christianity isn't about I do. It's about Jesus has done for us. The writer there showing us that just as God was faithful to Abraham in fulfilling his promise, God is also faithful to you and I, that when we come in faith, God is faithful to forgive us and to save us from our sins. So how can you have Jesus as the anchor for your soul? It begins by trusting in Jesus. You can have no peace or security in this life if you've not first surrendered your heart and your life to Jesus in faith. Because of God's love, he will come and he will attack every weak and false anchor that you and I trust in. He does it not out of anger, but out of love as an act of grace towards us. See, because he loves us, he comes to us. He wants us to have a relationship with him in all that we do. He does it so that we will learn to love him more and to trust him more. Maybe you're going through a storm right now. Feels like everything around you is going crazy. Maybe you feel God's mad at you or God is punishing you. In this moment, you have a decision to make. You can either continue to kick against God. You can continue to rebel against him and, and try to come to him in some other way other than faith, which will only lead to you dying in your sin and being eternally separated from God. Or you can see God taking away those false anchors in your life as an act of his love, as an act of his grace, and you can surrender to him today and you can have that assurance of the faithful, steadfast anchor that is found in Jesus. Yeah, I love what Pastor Robbie Gallaty said uh, another Sunday when he was preaching in Tennessee. He said, quote, sometimes God will take away the most valuable thing in your life to show you what's invaluable. You and I give a value, a worth to everything. 
The problem is we often misassign the worth. We put a high value on what we can see and a low value on the God that we don't. And so God will take what we think is valuable and he'll take it away to show us what's really meaningful and what's really valuable. Not only do you need to trust in Jesus, but you need to anchor your life in Jesus. Every one of you watching right now, you're anchoring your life and your eternity to something. If you want to know what the most valuable thing in your life is right now, look at what you spend the most time, energy, and resources on. Jesus said in Matthew 7 that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Our heart follows our treasure. What are you treasuring today? Some of you are getting your idea of worth and value from someone or something other than God. You feel like if I could just get a little more money, I'll be happy. A little more education, a little better uh, job. If I can find a, a husband or a wife, I can have kids, whatever, then it'll be enough. They look stable, but they're really quicksand. Because the moment you step in that quicksand, you realize there's not a firm foundation under you. And the harder you try to kick, the faster you sink. That's why Paul says to set your things, your mind on things that are above, not on things that are below. If you want to have peace and security in this life, then your anchor is going to have to be bigger than you, more powerful than your circumstances, and able to actually secure you and change you. And I'm telling you, only Jesus Christ can do that. So what's your anchor in life right now? What are you looking at to give you peace and security? What are you trusting in to give you purpose? Can it truly sustain you in good times and bad? Is what you're living for giving you meaning and value in your life? Or is it just a mirage? It's good today, but maybe it won't be tomorrow. The good news is Jesus is a sure and faithful anchor for your life and for your soul. You could admit this morning your sin of trusting in anything other than him, and you can turn in faith, surrendering, saying, Jesus, I only want to trust in you to save me, to give me meaning, to give me peace, to give me security in this life and the life to come. And he promises he will. So what's keeping you from anchoring your life in Jesus? Will you turn from it today that you could receive true eternal life? If I can help you, if I can pray for you, please reach out to me two ways, okay? prayer at westlakebaptist.org, or you can email me personally at pastorjustin at westlakebaptist.org. Please give me the privilege of telling you how you can anchor your life in the only anchor that can sustain you and secure you in this life and the life to come. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this morning and this opportunity. God, I pray that we have made much of Jesus I pray for those who are watching this right now. Father, if they are trusting in anyone other than you, God, would you make it abundantly clear to them that they would see their sin, but more importantly, God, they would see the Savior, that they would turn in faith to you, that today would be that day of salvation. Father, I overwhelm them with your grace, I pray. And Father, for those that are saved, but God, we're always so prone to... Allow our heart to drift. God, would you remove any false anchor in our life that we would only be anchored in you. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you and God bless you.